All right, we have the most amazing panel of kick-ass marketing women here. So I am super excited to talk to all of you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to my Southwest to all of you. I'm so jazzed to see all of your lovely faces in person. So, all right. I am Lauren Douglas. I'm the SVP of marketing at Channel Factory. I'm going to let all of these ladies introduce themselves, and then we'll get into the conversation. All right. Hello. Hi, everybody. My name is Sophia Oladenoye. I am Director of Branded Strategy at Hallmark Mahogany, um, which is a smaller brand within the Hallmark ecosystem or mothership. Mic check, mic check, one, two, one, mic check, two. Hello, thank you all for tuning in today. Um, my name is Sarah Moore. I'm Senior Vice President of Brand Marketing for MGM Resorts. And those that don't know, we operate 29 uh, franchise in the world. And then we have other brands you might have heard of called The Bar Method, Waxy the City. We've got a startup, um, hit workout, and a nutrition company that we own. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to South by Southwest. My name is Beverly Jackson. I'm the global vice president of brand and consumer marketing for Twitter. You may have heard of them, a little bird app that keeps you connected to the world or what's happening. Um, I'm responsible for our brands around the world, as well as our emerging products and consumer marketing products. All of our amazing activations like Tweeted Into Existence that you probably saw earlier this year, as well as our internal creative studio. So, tweet away at BevJack. I will respond. I won't, but you know. <laughs> we saw something yesterday that said being at South by is like being in Twitter. Th that is exactly right. And We're immersed. The in accurate it. thing. Cool. <laughs> and Sarah and I are having a little reunion, so I just wanted to mention that. So like for her and all have a reunion. Awesome. Hi, I'm Melissa Hobley. I'm the CMO at OKCupid, one of the biggest dating apps in the world. Some of you saw me yesterday. I cursed. Uh, fair warning. Get that Bloody Mary. Uh, and if you are single. Hit me up for a year of OkCupid Premium on me. There are so many good-looking single people in Austin right now, by the way, and I feel like a lot of them are here. So let's make it happen. This turns into a dating show at that. It is, and then MGM is gonna hook it up. So Sarah's gonna get you a room. There will be a room. You'll have that yeah, romantic yeah. card yeah. from Hallmark. Exactly. Just we'll post a tag. Work we'll out yes. together. Appreciate the wedding. No, she just okay. <laughs> All right, ladies. I, my first question is: We're on a women in marketing panel, and my first question to you is: Do we still need to have women in marketing panels? I'll jump in. Um, I'm conflicted, right? Because on one hand, I I'm the mother of two daughters, um, and I wish nothing more than when they're in the workforce that they're not in any women in insert industry here or any pronoun for that matter. Um, but on the other hand, we're not equal yet. And there's so much work left to do that we need these conversations, we need these forums to keep pushing. Does it put us into a like you're good at you're you're good at being a woman in business instead of you're just good at business. Like is there a distinction? But I think the 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 distinction is, is that, and I said this a couple weeks ago, there's never been a situation where you put a woman in charge of some shit that went sideways. Like, <laughs> like there's, a, there's a thing that says, like, trust black women. Just let women do it. Like, and like let us do it, and you will not be wrong. Like, lead, follow, or get out of the way. I absolutely love that. We talked a little bit this week about empathy and why empathy and vulnerability make us really good leaders. So, talk to me about why. Like, why are women great leaders because of our ability to have vulnerability and to be empathetic. I think um, when it comes to empathy and vulnerability, um, so much of being a leader is actually being of service to the people that you lead. Um, and so if you can't take the opportunity or take a pause to be able to put yourselves into the shoes of the younger people you're leading, or even older people you're leading, um, who are trying to figure things out or trying to get to a place where they can really take the baton and run, um, then you really don't set your people up to be able to 
really take your place something, right? Like that's the real reason and purpose of leadership. It's not just for you to be in a high position and people are just chasing after you all the time so that they can actually replace you. And so you have to have empathy and have to have vulnerability so you can go, okay, they didn't get it this time. They didn't get it the fifth time. They didn't get it the tenth time. That's fine. Um, but they are going to get it. And so, you know, obviously boundaries, all the other things, but giving room for that so that your people can actually grow. Um, and the thing is, your people actually work far harder for you uh, when they know that you're taking the time to actually put yourself in their shoes. But I think vulnerability is uh, what you have to be yourself as a leader. And I will admit it, it has taken me a very long time to be comfortable to be vulnerable. And I think it's because it, your women are inherently, I'm sorry, some of you aren't, insecure. Right? I mean, I went to the we went to Brene, syndrome. Yeah, so we went to Brene Brown last night, and I think you, a lot of you probably know who she is. She kicks ass. And we got to see her, the first of her five part series. She literally then came on stage and did a QA, and she told us that she was so nervous, she won't watch anything she's done. She was standing in the back and was forced to watch it. And then she said, I bet no one's going to come. There were tons of people that got rejected that couldn't come in. She said, I bet no one's going to ask a question. And I'm like, Brene Brown feels this way? We all feel this way all the time. And so to be able to be a leader and be vulnerable and say, I don't have the answers. I don't know what to go do. That makes your people feel really comfortable. But that takes a lot of confidence. I actually even think the most three most powerful words are I don't know. And and really being able to say, like, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. Like, how can I figure that out? How can I how can I do some deeper dives but, here to understand? But followed that? by encouraging your team to help you figure it out, right? Literally you know, I said this to someone who is on my team who just took a, a great new leadership role and we were having coffee right before we came up here and I said, if I'm in this job five years from now, I have failed. And she was like, no, my God, we're going to have you, you're going to do something new and different. And I was like, no, 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 no. You miss what I mean by that. You all should be ready to take my job and you should be able to do it with whatever fear or hesitation you might have, but by watching me sort of go through that pathway, you're comfortable in doing that. And, and so it's so right, like, we, like the thing that makes women great leaders is that we're okay sharing the stage and the spotlight. Just by the fact that there's six of us jammed up on this little bitty ass stage. <laughs> I might fall off, I might. If I reach out to that water one more time, it's gonna be a Twitter moment. We charge extra for those. Well, it's fine. <laughs> All right, so I think the answer is we still need to have women in marketing panels today, but then hopefully in 10 years, we don't need to anymore, right? It's just people in marketing. So, yeah, I like it. Um, all right, I am gonna shift us a little bit. So what, um, you know, why are, um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. Uh, what can we help to teach the next generation of women? So obviously we've come up in the time of, we are now talking about and actually implementing diversity and inclusion efforts in our organizations and beyond. We're, you know, we're trying to get gender parity, pay parity within our organizations and beyond. Um, we've come up when this, these things weren't there, right? And um, what, what do we teach the next generation of women, the ones that are behind us, and what lessons can we, can we really help them to understand? Well, okay, so, so I have two daughters as well, and when I look at them, I don't want them to experience what I've experienced. And I think I wasted a lot of time at a lot of companies where I couldn't be myself. And I had to fit into a mold. I had to sit in cer a certain way, look a certain way, speak a certain way. And only really now I'm at a company where they hired me for me, who I am, my skill set, what I can bring, and I have autonomy. God, if I could have found that earlier in my life. And so how do you create comfort in who you are, what you're really good at from an early age, and then find a place that fits that? I, that is something I you know, would do over. I think I would build on that um, with two things. I think, you know, at Mahogany, it's actually really dope. We have a team full of black women. Um, and so from Alexis Kerr, who's our VP, um, down to our, you know, marketing assistant, black women who are just trying to figure out and navigate the world. And I remember when I was very, like the beginning of my career, um, I remember one of my aunts could have a fro. She was like, you have to change your hair. I'm not gonna hire you. And I was like, if they don't hire me, then I shouldn't be there. Right? Um, and so there is a gumption that I think comes, right? Um, with younger, each younger generation. Um, but I think the thing that I would probably pass on would also be to remember that it's a marathon um, and it's not a sprint, right? And so when you remember that, and particularly for myself as a black woman, right? Then you figure out which battles do I want to fight?
which ones do I need to put down, right? I remember one time I was leading a team and I said to them, I'm not going to fight every battle. I don't have the bandwidth, I'm not going to do it, right? Because I also need to rest. Um, and so, and you need to rest, right? So what are the things we really want to go after? What are the things we really want to chase? What are the things we really want to die on a hill for? Um, and then that also gives you room to then be really clear about, here's my lane, here's where my contributions are, here's where my strengths are, sorry. Um, here's where I can show up, and then you start, to your point, right? Really choosing the places that really align and fit for you. Um, and so when you remember it's a marathon, and it's not a sprint, you don't have to fight every battle, um, then you start to really get better at like reserving your um, energy. And one of my old bosses used to say, you know, uh, what do you say? Uh, jab, 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 you know, and then like a punch, right? So it was like, you could go jab, 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 and then a right hook, right? And so like, give your jabs, but then when you reserve enough energy, then you can give that right hook and knock them out, right? And so it's really about remembering it's a marathon, remembering that you're gonna sign up for doing this work and being in this space that you are pacing yourself and taking your time. And just to jump in, it's on the guys. It is on the guys. Like, we have to also shift the responsibility from from everything that we're doing. Many of us in this room are in tech, and we have to look at the men in that room where 90 to 95 to 100% of the people in that meeting are men. And if you are not having the conversations about why is everyone in this, why is everybody in this room have a dick, then then you're not you're not being the advocate and the ally. I mean, really, it, it's, I, I start to get frustrated because I think we have to shift that we're, we will not be able to solve these equality issues ourselves. Only 3% of board seats in the U.S. are held by women. That is abominable. When I saw the Lola speaker was so amazing, but the reason why we don't know the ingredients of important products in our lives is because women are not in the room making those decisions. So you have to, um, for the people in the room, that it was easier to get on your way up. You have to be having those conversations. And you know, I think a little thing, too, that that we can do is I have conversations, but I also have two daughters. This is apparently the two daughter club. That was a prerequisite for getting on the panel. I talk all the time about I have to leave to take my daughter to dance, or I have to leave to do this, or I need to do this because when I was coming up, I'm ex Walgreens corporate, and when I was coming up in the ranks, every man that I worked with, I was one of the youngest VPs, and every man that I worked with had a wife who did not work. And what that meant was he never was at the doctor, he never picked up the sick kid, he was never at the school appointment, and it, re it I was so self conscious when I had those appointments, and so have those conversations but also guys in the room if you have a partner that isn't working you need to be aware of what it's like for the working parents in the room okay thank you for coming to my ted talk <laughs> two quick points on that um back to your original question i think the easy answer that you see across all of these panels is confidence we need to build up the next generation of women's confidence and before you can even do that you have to instill validation and it's one of the things I instill in my daughter is that everything you're feeling, everything you're going through is valid. Everything. When I'm, I'm experiencing with employees who are having tough days and maybe it's a little warranted, maybe it's not. They're still 100% valid to feel that way. So I think before we can ever talk about confidence, it has to be about validation. And absolutely, Melissa, to your point, second quick point, yes. um, we, we at MGM have these things called courageous conversations where we bring together senior senior leaders and we talk about how do we make MGM an employer of choice for women and, and it's not just oh let's you know put more women in leadership roles it's really transparent conversations about paid family leave and, and about and again it's also like training and, and development for confidence and in our last one I was like yo no it's about training the men in this company we, they need to be trained on gender yeah. bias and subconscious bias yeah. and how they're bringing that and so we're, we're actively looking no more is this just on the female side and what are we doing to prepare them to be more aggressive but what are we doing to actually train the men to create and lift them up i'm just gonna i, I gotta say this just because it's that moment in time right because like you said a lot of people in here in tech and so here's the one thing that i would say to the men in the room and the women who are responsible for this because there's so much i can say about the other stuff but we're in a point in time for tech where we're doing comp plan. So I'm gonna say this, and I'm gonna say it loud for the people in the back of the room. Pay women what they're fucking worth. Don't hold back on the money, don't skimp on it, don't give them less because you think they'll take it. Pay them what they're worth, and don't look back. And if you have to stand on a soapbox in the middle of a conference room to make sure that your boss knows why you are paying her what she's worth, 
do it for your daughters, for your wives, for your sisters, and for the women like me and these women who are sitting on the panel who will kick your ass if we don't. <laughs> add to everything you all are saying, right? Um, and I know we keep hearing it, but it's also representation. When I was able to see senior vice presidents, CEOs, CMOs, who were black women, who were people of color, who were women in these positions, really driving things forward, and I said, oh, I can do it, right? When I was able to see, I actually just ran into a former founder and CEO downstairs, right? Watching him, I remember walking with him, interviewing and being like, oh, this is what wealth looks like. This is what black wealth looks like. I didn't know what generational wealth looks right, like. Right, what generational wealth looks like. Oh no, I know I can go get it, right? Um, and so it's that, or you know, being in a position to then be able, I remember I, I've hired people, and then they were like, oh, it's, here's my little amount. And I was like, it was women. And I was like, no, we're gonna double what you just told me. So that way, you know, the next time you go into any room with anyone, you go know it's double, right? And then you look, because again, to go back to insecurity and confidence, like being able to have somebody else there who goes, no, I'm passing the baton, right? And so a thousand percent to everything we're saying, and I think it's just the more, and that's why I keep saying it's a marathon, right? The more that you're like, okay, I'm going to pass the baton. I may not be able to fully break the glass ceiling this time around, but I can pass the baton to somebody who will, so... What do you, I mean, how does mentorship play into, you know, what we're talking about? Do, does everybody here have a mentor or a mentee, um, or multiple mentees? And is that part of our responsibility as the next leadership generation of women to have those mentorships? And I think you, I mean, we've all heard this, you need your own personal board of directors, right? And and you have to have that, and you, you build that over time, and when you, when you first start, it's scary. But then you realize you can ask people. I was um, at the dinner last night, I was sitting next to this, like lovely French woman, and her name is Alice. She's lovely. She's here. But anyway, I talked about it with her, and I said, "Okay, so what do you want to go do?" And we talked about what she wants to do. And I said, "How are you going to do that? Who are you going to talk to?" She goes, "I don't know." I go, "I'll be on your personal board of directors." So we linked, and I because it's my job to help her not be insecure, to have confidence, and then I said, "What you have to do is pay this forward. You have to talk about a personal board of directors with someone else and do that for them." And you have, and your personal board of directors shouldn't be all female or all male. It should be diverse. It should be inclusive so that you see the world through their eyes and through different lenses. And I think not only should you have that personal board of directors, but you should tell them, equip them with what you want to carry forth. Like, not just your personal board of directors and the three people are randomly talking about you, but what is it that you want them to say about you? Like, I can't be everybody's mentor. I have a team of like 140 people. I can't be everybody's mentor right now, right? I got little nieces. I don't have any daughters and so I, I have, have nieces too. I was gonna say, I if nieces. I walk downstairs and there's two people <laughs> claiming to be my kids, uh, it wasn't me. Uh, so, and I would like to be in your family. I just, I'm just gonna raise my hand. I'm Try to stop from falling off the stage. <laughs> See, you're already, you're already taking care of me. Like allyship. That's what it looks like. Don't let your sister friend fall off the stage. <laughs> but, but you know, it's like, what is it that you want people to know about you? Like, and, and you figure out what that is, and you make sure that they can articulate a story that leads into why you are that thing, and that they tell that for you, so that when you show up that way. They know, like like Sarah said, if you spent two minutes with me, you knew that I was probably gonna drop the F-bomb and I'm <laughs> sure that Liz is down there in the audience going, that's not the comms message for the first time. I'm sorry, Liz, I'm sorry. I think I would add to that, um, it's very important to have mentors, I've had phenomenal mentors, but it's also really important to have sponsors. People are gonna be in the room for you, who are gonna go, like I literally have had sponsors who've been like, hey, I have a job for you. Here's how much this person is making for this role, X, Y, and Z, and then I go get bet. Then I'm, sorry, I'm from New York. A uh, sponsor uh, can change your game. I was just, you literally took my talking point. No, in a good way. I, I actually hate the word mentor, mentorship. It's been so bastardized over the last couple of years. It's like this formal process that you have. No. Sponsorship? Mentorship insinuates like passive. I'll be here to mentor you along the way. Sponsorship is action. It's actually going out of your way to help people achieve their goals. And so find your sponsors, be a sponsor, find a sponsor for yourself, and you know, create that tribe. Um, can we talk about self-esteem? Self -esteem? Um, your company is called Self-Esteem Brands, and I know we talked a little bit about like confidence and helping build confidence and self-esteem. You brought up the point the other day on our prep talk of 
well, what's, how do women think about self-esteem versus how do men think about self-esteem? So would you mind elaborating on that a bit, Sure, sure. So um, the company I work for, the purpose of our company is to improve the self-esteem of the world. It's pretty lofty, but I, we genuinely work for two founders that do this every day. And I know in a fitness brand, you could say, okay, sometimes that's weight loss. Actually, sometimes it's weight gain, or sometimes it's someone had an amputated leg and they need to walk again. Sometimes it's mental health. I mean, it's all of the things, and they... We have a company, a culture that I've never seen before because people are so tied to the purpose of self-esteem. But when you're working at a company that's about building the self-esteem and you have your moments of not having self-esteem, you, know, you realize, okay, you guys should think about it. I mean, way more than I've ever thought about it. And at the end of the day, women just fundamentally have imposter syndrome, right? We all, if Brene Brown doesn't think anyone's showing up, like I said, like we fundamentally are, we judge ourselves, right? And I'm not saying we don't have, all have confidence in key moments, but our core is to doubt ourselves, whereas men, I had this friend once whose husband was not even in the comms space, was applying for a comms job, and she goes, you have none of the qualifications. He's like, oh, I'm sure I could do it. Like, we would never put ourselves in that position, and so we have to constantly be reminding ourselves why we're great, right? And and then when we're vulnerable, God, no, I'm not so great at this. Like, I'm a, a CMO, I was, I used to be, I, run a, uh, I used to run a VEDA, and now I went back into marketing, and there is a lot going on in the space right now. And there are things I do not know, right? And I can choose to be insecure about it, or I can just say I need help. I need to figure out the data problem over here. I need to figure out the CRM system. And I think just constantly reminding yourself that you're, you are great, you get up in the morning, you're gonna have a good day, you're gonna make a difference, and that smart self-talk is really, really important. But, and men, I'm not saying any of you aren't insecure, but God, I wish I had I wish I was innately yeah. born yeah. with what you have that I think we DNA-wise do not have. I think also with self-esteem, um, to your point, right? Like we live in a society where men are just supported to go, no, I'll just figure it out, right? And women, even from other women sometimes, are like, oh, but do you have all hundred things? And going back to sponsorship, right? One of my sponsors was like, what would a mediocre, straight, no offense guys, white man do? What would he think? How would he operate? And so for a while, I was like, Ugh, and then he kept training me. No, what would he do? And I remember working for some of these folks and being like, you have two things out of the 25 on this job description. And you said, fuck it, I'm gonna go for the job. And so I said, if you've got two, and I know I have 15, then that means I can do the job that you're doing. It's just a distinction between me saying it for myself, right, going to your point, versus me just going for it. And so, not to anybody, but like, it's like, what would a mediocre person do? And if a mediocre person's gonna go for it, then maybe you. I, you know, it's, it's so interesting, because we talk about this a lot with my team, because it's so diverse, lots of women, lots of people of color, lots of members of the LGBTQ plus community, like, it's just a very diverse group. And so, I'm probably the old white man in the group. Like, they're all like, oh my God, you move like an old white dude. And I'm like, hey, what's wrong with that? Like, okay, I'm the old white dude today, right? But, but <laughs> it's the truth. I swear to you that they say that. That's, I didn't make that up. It's not something I'm claiming. I'm not like, trying to have like prostate issues. Yes, man. But I'm just saying, it's just, it's just how I move through the world, right? But, but what I, but, but I think what I ultimately get at is, I'm also, as much as I, I, as I look like that to them, I'm an older black woman in that space. And so it, from, the, from the moment that I joined this to the place where I am right now, my face has changed, my body has changed, my resume has changed, what people expect of me has changed, how I show up has changed. And sometimes that's with confidence, sometimes that's with humility, sometimes that's with fucking terror. Like, and when I sign on to my all hands and all 40, 140 of those little faces are looking back at me in that box, I'm just like, we can do this. We can do it. We can do this. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, we can do this. And like, and then I believe it. And if I say we can do it, they will believe that we can do it. And I always tell them, we move together as one. And when we move together as one, it strengthens us individually. And it becomes that Luda song, when I move, you move. Just like that. <laughs> it's I love like, this part of Luda. <laughs> it's like that um, McKinsey study where the majority of men are promoted based on potential and the majority yeah. of women are promoted based on experience. Yes. And so, you know, I'm the biggest offender. I'm convinced every week my CEO is coming in like, no, we figured you out. You're gone. <laughs> 
fuck up your shit. He is fire. never gonna fire you, man. He loves you and you fucking get it what you do. So no. That's why I bring her along. Um but I think you bring up such an important point. It's like instilling that in our teams. I, I, I sit in front of many of our team members and talk about where you want to go, what do you want to do? Well, and yeah, you might not have the right experience for it, but let's try. Let's try. Let's let's create some opportunities, some stretch projects that so you can get exposed to it and not be willing to kind of perpetuate that. You don't need the experience. You know, I put a mini bar manager from Mandalay Bay into a marketing manager role. He had a degree, he had zero experience, and he turned out to be one of the best hires I've ever had. So you, you got it, you have to perpetuate it intentionally. I, I think I was gonna say, I think about that. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna embarrass her and call her out. But there's a young woman in the back of the room who now works for you that I hire, who she wouldn't have gotten an opportunity. You can't have her, you take her you can't, you can't have, I might come steal her, but traditionally she would never have gotten on paper. On paper. She never would have gotten the opportunity, but we created the opportunity, we trained her, we built her up, we instilled in her that the opportunity was hers, and she's rocking it. Like, I might come steal her. I'm just saying. No <laughs> joke in performance well. reviews this year, she was the <laughs> highest rated employee amongst 100 prime employees. With, with yeah. non yeah. Stand up back there, Chelsea. Stand yeah. up. Stand up, Chelsea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Cupid is hiring Chelsea. Yeah. <laughs> Chelsea, Twitter's got a great equity package. The stock is coming back. We make love and babies. Great female Chelsea. Chelsea. I love her this room is so like loving and the rising tide lifts all boats. So I think it's awesome. Um, okay, I'm gonna shift this a little bit. You can have her. Right? This is not a conflict for me. I think I'm fair. I think it's fair game. <laughs> All right, I'm going to shift us a little bit and talk about representation and inclusion um, and how does that relate to your marketing efforts. So, Melissa, I'm going to start with you because you as the CMO of OKCupid have some crazy ass ads going on in the subway to the point where people are actually putting covers over the ads and saying, children, ride this train. So, yeah. after having met you, I'm not surprised by this, but tell me a little bit about your thoughts behind this campaign. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. So, OKCupid, one of the things, we're one of the OG dating apps, and in this landscape, it's hard, and, you know, we're, we're the underdog, and one of the things, I, um, one of the interesting things with OKCupid, I never had a CMO, had never done campaigns, and when I joined, some of my teams here, they're, they're amazing, um, when I joined, we're like, we need to tell people why this app is great, and by the way, plug, we are the only dating app in the world that will let you match on the social and political issues <laughs> that you care about. You want to filter out people that don't believe in climate change? No other app is doing that. You want to find people that are voters or that care about reproductive rights? <laughs> Texas. Um, we're the only app that does that. And by the way, those are important ingredients for meeting people. And so when we were working on campaigns, and also when you're the underdog and the other folks that have been in this situation, or you're a new agency, or you're the, the you know, it's a David and Goliath situation, your our outreach, your pitch letter, your marketing has to be louder and bolder, but it's got to be connected to something that's true. And um, OkCupid has always had the best LGBTQ experience. We've spent years creating experience for non-binary daters that, that was better than ever. By the way, we're always working on that. It can be, you know, every day we're, we're, we're improving and enhancing it. So the campaign that we rolled out uh, said for every single person, and in giant font, font around the U.S., it says for every single non-binary, for every single pansexual, for every single... And on and on and on, and some of it was for every single romantic, but the, the, the couples are women of color, they are men of color, it's, uh, they're queer, they're non-binary, and all the models, many of them were activists, actually are what the, what, what their, what that campaign says is. If you haven't seen it, by the way, you should check it out on OkCupid's um, Instagram. But people got really angry, there was a video that went viral of people ripping it down on an active New York City subway. And Tucker Carlson in the far right really embraced it. And we're like, yeah, you're, you're, and they accused us of, of trying to corrupt their children with these beautiful images of queer and gay couples. There are lots of images they didn't like, but I think especially those. And, um, and, and you know, it was, uh, it was a moment. And then we said, well, fuck it. We have to double down. We donated, for every hate tweet we got, we donated a dollar to GLAAD. Uh, I love it. I know. No, but, 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 but amazing because the love, the support that came out, like George Takai posted a comment from me that was like, fuck all of you, like we're, we're in. And so 
but what was really interesting is w when we started doing campaigns like this, we, we uh, several of our images were of two women. And I, I did not even realize this, but um, we had queer couples, I told this story briefly yesterday, uh, but we had queer female couples or individuals reach out to us and say, I have not seen two women in a national ad campaign in a romantic scenario. And we pulled up to a stoplight and see this giant billboard and now we're crying. And, and, and so the idea of how important representation is, um, is just so central to us. And if that's not for you, you can fuck off. But also, it's a, it's a business story too because allyship matters. And, and even if you are straight and cis and you know, you're looking for your husband or wife and a, and a dog and whatever, you, you care more and yeah, you care more and more that your, your friends, your family members that have been ignored by other dating apps have a good experience. And that's brought OkCupid back to be an app that people are flocking to. I love it. Oh, it's never the right thing to New York. That scares me, right? In New York City. There's so much more work to do if that's happening in New York. Yeah. Yeah. That is kind of scary to me, and I'm glad that Twitter was able to help in a good way. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Write that down, Liz, because Twitter helps. Twitter is amazing. But, you know, I want to say this other thing about, like, just inclusion. We did a campaign also, like, all this out-of-home work, is, and we took a bold, beautiful black woman who was a new recent college graduate, you know her as Meg Thee Stallion, and we put her all over New York and the subway and San Francisco and LA and Toronto. But the other thing that we did that was a part of that campaign from an inclusion standpoint, because I just want to be mindful of this, is that for all the other celebrities that were there, the people that tweeted something when they weren't famous and then it manifested into their dream, whether it was Issa Rae or, 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 um, or Patrick Mahomes or, or whoever, there was also a blind gamer in that group. And so we made these digital braille billboards so that he could be celebrated in that way. And I just think that like, when you position marketing teams led by women primarily to think outside the box about how you include people and how you show up for communities that aren't in the room, that's equally important. That campaign was so beautiful, by the way. Yes. Everybody's talking yes. about that. It was amazing. Yes. Also, I have a crush on Simu Liu from China. Same, same. Like, oh my God. Yes. Same, same. Oh, love it. Um, I think I would just also add to that, and you were kind of touching upon this, Melissa. Uh, I remember watching that video of people ripping things down, because I am from New York, and I was like, not fully surprised, not as surprised. Yes, people are crazy everywhere. Um, but I will say this, from a business standpoint as well, right? For so many diverse communities, LGBTQIA+, black and brown, AAPI, all of these different communities, um, differently abled, the buying power is increasing for each of these communities. What is actually shifting in America's demographics and psychographics is also shifting to be from a more inclusive standpoint. I'm saying this because I do multicultural research for you know working with Hallmark Mahogany and others. Um, and so I see the data on a regular basis and it's like, this is shifting, right? People can feel what they want to feel, but this is shifting, and so, not even shifting. Shifting is the wrong word. Shifting makes it sound like it's sudden. No, it's in an evolution, and it's been happening, and it's continuing to happen. When you talk about Gen Z and the generations that are coming afterwards, they are growing up in a very, very, very different world than a lot of us have grown up in. And so, from a business standpoint, it just, to me, sometimes I'm like, don't you see that this is happening? Don't you see that you actually need to tap in and talk and engage with people and show up? You know, my, for myself, when I don't see myself in ads or things like that, I'm not really interested. Right? And for younger generations, it's even more so. They're like, oh, I don't see myself, so I don't care. Um, and you don't want to be on the wrong side of history. And you don't want to be on the wrong side, of history. Wrong side of history. We have a newcomer. Hi. Hi. Hi there. Hi there. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, hey, everybody. <laughs> Um, and so I think also just from like, you know, because we we're up here and we're talking about empathy, we're talking about vulnerability, we're talking about self-esteem, we're talking about all of these things that are, I'm going to talk in a research standpoint, that are more qualitative and let's say a little bit intangible. From a quantitative, tangible standpoint, the whole business space is shifting and it's moving. And so when I look at businesses that aren't necessarily moving in that direction, I'm like, you're going to be behind. Just and, from a volume standpoint. And for those of you that are, you know, some of you are great agencies that we do want to meet and talk, you should be telling us that. And also, yep. we are not interested in working with agencies that are not diverse or that yep. are not giving back or that don't yep. have that don't have all the perspectives at yep. the table that, that we need. So, you know, um, 
call that out. Let us know. Let us know what you know what's interesting about it. It's not just that you get uh, really great CPMs or you have access to this, but it is increasingly important. I know I know many people at this table are working on that. That we want to work with partners that have all of the audiences and people that uh, that we need. So all right, I'm going to toss one to Sunny over here. here. Um, so I want to talk about culture because Harlem Globetrotters is a 98 year old organization, 96 year old organization, and they're really reinventing themselves in culture. And I want to talk. We've been talking about culture. We've been talking about shifts and, and how everything is changing. And I just want to talk a little bit about Harlem Globetrotters and what you're doing as it relates to culture. So, so it's interesting how things work. Oh, I need to sit down. She said, sit down. <laughs> sit down, sister. You know, it's how all the things that you can control, right? You want to have things arranged. You want to have process. You have a flow. Everything's going to work out exactly how you think it should. Well, it don't. And that was my day-to-day, -day, but it's also kind of reflective of, like, how all of this works. It's like being flexible and agile. So the Globetrotters are a 96-year-old, what I call startup, um, an iconic, beloved brand that um, has a need to reimagine itself to be more relevant for that next generation of fans, right? A lot of people in here, like, who knows how the Globetrotters, like, don't hurt them. Exactly. There's a whole generation that has no idea, right? So it's how are we bringing that connectivity in, like, in a meaningful way? This is the most ethnically diverse generation that's coming of age. And we have to find the right ways to be able to like connect in that 360, like on and off the court, right? So kind of lean into all those things that resonate for like folks like in your everyday life. So that's kind of the journey that we're on and the pandemic really turned the faucet off, right? We were kind of also being partnered with, right? And so to your point in regards to that mandate, anytime we've ever like sourced for partners, we're like, well, who's on your team? Right? And not just who's on your team, but also let's get into conversation about what are your team's perspectives on things, right? Because it shouldn't just be your team has like one little, you know, person of color or things of that nature or one woman on the team, right? It should and is that person speaking? Are they contributing? Are they just there as part of the photos on your website? Right? Like and so like let's really get into conversation and really vet are these people the right people that we want to partner with and we want to give our dollars to, right? And I think to the things that you guys are talking about, the more that brands are shifting, then everybody else has got to shift, right? So it becomes a, a, a what is the word? Y'all know what I'm trying to say. Uh, movement, thank you. But I think cycle. especially when you live, like, you know, I, I live in Minneapolis. Okay. So we don't have a lot of diversity in our company, so I have to partner yeah. to get that perspective. And then you come to an event like this and you realize you're doing all these things and you're like, I gotta do more. You yeah. said the voice, yeah, you give everyone the voice and you get ideas of how to do more. But it is even more important when you can't find, you know, your own. But you know, I just want to say this, I mean, we're gonna, Sarah's gonna jump in on this, I already know this, right? So like, it's, when we talk about culture, so like leading a global brand, it's more than just the, the parentheses that make up the United States, right? And so it is thinking about the American, going from North America marketing to going to marketing for the Americas. It is also, you know, thinking about how you show up in different places. And so Sarah and I spent a lot of time traveling back and forth to Japan, right? And so you get this black woman with braids and a tall blonde woman, and we show up talking to a bunch of Japanese people. We don't speak a word. Japanese men. Japanese men, right. In hot little rooms, pre-pandemic. Uh, the door is closed. I'm like, am I having a hot flash? Is this a <laughs> I'm not the whole. Like, what's happening here? But like, culture and being very respectful of that place and showing up with purpose and intent and being our authentic selves, bringing the leadership and, the ex and our own expertise, but being super respectful of that culture because it runs just as deep. And so when we have these global roles, seeing sort of where that uh, where that can take us and how we show up and being mindful and thoughtful of those those places because Sarah and I were on a plane I, I will tell this one quick story Sarah and I were on a plane going to Japan and the flight went from Las Vegas to Los Angeles Los Angeles to Minneapolis Minneapolis to Tokyo and then we took a train to Osaka well no I think I dropped you off in Tokyo and then I went to Osaka somehow whatever there's a woman on one of the flights Sarah and I both have our masks and this is literally pre-pandemic February 25th 2020 that, wow. Never forget it. That's my birthday. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and this woman, 
this Japanese lady was leaning over like low key trying to take a snap of us, the two weird looking Americans with the mask on. She had a mask on, right? It's like culturally a part of what happens. And Sarah and I were like, oh no, we good with it. <laughs> we are like, this is my good side, actually. This is my good side. <laughs> All right, so we only have five minutes left. So what I want for, for each of you, each of you, everything they just said. I, I want to get one piece of leadership advice that you play over in your head that you would give out to somebody else. So for me, somebody told me those two words, play slow, and I always think about it every single day, play slow, don't rush, you're good, play slow. Um, so I want to hear from each of you, what are what's one piece of leadership advice you've gotten that you would pass on? This was actually the, um, the motto that my, and when I was in college, I'm a product of Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia. Right, shout out to the HBC. Yeah, and you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, unbeknownst to me at that time, but mine is find a way or make one. Um, so much good advice. I think, similar to you, take a beat. Right? Something I say to people I work with and the teams I work with all the time, just take a beat. Um, because sometimes, both from just like, a, I'm big on self-care, self-care, boundary standpoint, but then also um, from a strategic standpoint, right? Sometimes things are moving so fast in business, you're just like rushing. And sometimes when you're working with your team, you're like, did you think that through, right? Because everybody's moving. Wasn't building day, right? right, it wasn't built in a day. So it's just like, take a beat. Does this make sense? Does the people we want to partner with, does that make sense? The strategy we've come up with, does that make sense? Because um, then you actually, as much as things are rushing, you actually produce better work. So, yeah. Mine is uh, life advice that turned into an anchor of my leadership style, but um, when I was a kid, my mom told me, always use your heart. Uh, so mine is, it never waste a good crisis. And so uh, I had a boss. <laughs> I had a boss that led like that, and I, I worked with him um, for Procter & Gamble. We were in hair care, and it was, it was a really, really hard time. And it's amazing when you're in crisis what you're not scared to do. And so whether it's a supply chain crisis, a pandemic, remember how you operate, how, how confident you feel in yourself, the risks you're willing to take, and then do that as much as you can when you're not in crisis. Right? It is amazing how things can happen when you can remove all fear from, from what you're thinking. Mine is probably something like Sarah, I learned really early on, and it is be yourself. So I am the same person on the Twitter timeline as Bev Jack as I am on a stage or in a boardroom around the world. I am just my authentic self. You can only perpetuate a lie for so long. So just rip the band-aid off and expose people to who you are because that's what you can sustain and scale. Uh, and mine, and we, this is one I know a lot of you have heard. Uh, people will not remember what you did. They will remember how you made them feel. And a lot of us are in creative roles or we have, we're taking big chances or big bets or big gambles. And, and our team, I know, I can feel when they feel supported and they feel like you have their back, the work is even better and knowing it's a safe place to be. So uh, that, that's mine. Well, I think we've successfully burned this shit down. So thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Well, I think that you guys assume based on the uh, size of the audience, you guys might have some questions. So I think we have time for one or two. So uh, anyone? I mean, we, we covered a lot. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, hang on one second. Uh, mine's just a comment as a humble, um, mediocre white male. <laughs> Best, best fucking panel of the day. Awesome. Last night, I've been here since 8.45. There's some serious badass panels. Uh, and I'm also to hear again that the idea of how, how you leave people feeling matters more than anything else you said. And it seems from the smiling face in the audience that you left everybody feeling pretty, pretty optimistic and pretty happy. So thank you ladies so much. Thank you.